I want to start by teaching you the process of how to prepare very simple objects to print and this is very important because this is the process I'm going to use for pretty much the entire tutorial and also I'll be looking at some different options we have for slicing objects and go through some of the obstacles we may encounter. So <clears throat> Knowing the basic process of how to prepare a mesh for printing is essential. It's a pretty straightforward process, but you may end up getting confused if you're dealing with lots of different meshes. So I'll try to make this as simple as possible and start by taking a look on how we can prep this object for printing. What I have here is this simple statue that I want to print and it's separated into two different objects. So if I move this base, you can see there is a hole inside and this fits perfectly with the, the blue object. So let's take a look at how we can print this. Our first option is to print these two objects separately and this will actually print just fine. There's no need for sports and yeah, this will be pretty easy to print, but there is a catch. Unless I print this base with a flexible material, I won't be able to piece these two objects back together because this edge around here is too tight. So this is what's going to happen. The, the blue object doesn't pass through this area. So yeah, option one is to print this object separately, but I'll have to use a flexible material for the base. Our second option is to just merge these objects together um, and dynamesh them. So I'll duplicate both of these objects and click here where it says merge down and dynamesh them. So this way I will only have to print one single object. Just need to make sure that Dynamesh took care of merging both pieces correctly. So I need to take a closer look. And this would be something that I could print just fine. The only thing I have left to do is to decimate this object and send it to Cura to print. Decimation is the process to lower the poly count and I will show you how to do that in a moment. And let's take a look at our third option because this is the one I'm going to use most of the time on my character and it's the most fun to do. So option, option two was pretty okay. It's very functional, it works, but it's no fun at all to print. Uh, it's more fun when we are able to print objects separately and piece them back together and that's what I'm going to do now. But I'll have to take care of that all first. So let's isolate this base and turn on polygroups. So what I want to do with this piece is to cover this hole and using polygroups to isolate or hide certain parts of the object is very useful. So I will use that for my advantage. And I then delete this polygroup and now just need to go to Geometry, Modify Topology and click here where it says Delete Hidden. That way I can get rid of any invisible geometry and now that this object doesn't have any thickness I can either use Dynamesh and this will close all the holes on this object or I can just go here to Modify Topology again and click here on close holes and this might be more useful because it creates a, a new polygroup for this new geometry okay so we took care of one problem but i'm still not able to piece these two objects together with that hole closed i'm not even able to fit this part inside the base and this is when we need to use booleans. So the boolean process is basically tell ZBrush what to do when you merge two or more objects. And by default, the boolean process is set to head on every single subtool you create. What that means is that if I go here and duplicate these two objects, uh, merge them and dynamesh them, 
I will be left with only the outer shell of these two objects because all the interior was deleted when I dynameshed these objects. And this happens because the Boolean process of both subtools were set to add. And you can change the Boolean process by clicking on any of these three uh, symbols. So the first one, which is set by default, is Add. I'm going to click on this second icon and this means that I will make this object a subtractor. I changed its Boolean process to subtract. What will happen now is that if I duplicate again these two objects and leave this one to subtract and this one to add by default, and just before doing anything else, I just need to turn on Dynamesh on the, on the object it's set to add. So I'm going to merge them now, Dynamesh again, and this will take just a few seconds. So this is what happens. ZBrush will remember that you change the Boolean process of the, the object to subtract, and it will delete all the geometry that is intersecting with the, with the subtractor. So you will be left with the blue object minus the area that was intersecting with the base. This process was something that you had to do before Pixelogic launched Live Boolean. So you can find Live Boolean by going to Render and Render Booleans. By turning on Live Boolean, you will get a, a real-time preview of what is happening with these objects when you change their, their Boolean process. If the objects are set to Add, you won't see any changes, but if I change this to subtract and if live boolean is turned on, I will get this real-time preview of what the object looks like. One very important thing to remember is that not only you can have multiple objects with different boolean processes and still get the real-time preview of live booleans, but you need to make sure that all the objects set to subtract need to be underneath the ones that are set to add. So if I take this subtractor and move it above the blue object that is set to add, I won't see anything happen. And that's because the subtractor needs to be underneath the object that is going to be subtracted. This is where it might get very confusing if you are working with many different subtools. You just need to remember where they need to be positioned on the subtool list. Let's also change this subtool to intersect to see what happens. And here you are left with only the area that is intersecting with the other object. So yeah, this is what it looks like. And okay, let's change this back to subtract because this is the piece that we want to create. And now to make this an actual um, object, we just need to go down here to Booleans and click on this button that says Make Boolean Mesh. This will take just a second. So after it's done, the new object was created as a new tool up here. You can go there to check it out. And this is the actual object that we created using the live Boolean. This is not a live preview anymore. So let's take this object and insert on the subtool list, turn off live boolean, we don't need it anymore. I can go ahead and delete the original object so it doesn't get too confusing. We end up with two separate objects that we can print just fine, but we still have a small problem. Unless I glue these two objects together, I have no way of keeping them attached to each other. And in many cases that would be just fine. But let's say you have some sort of detail on this side of the objects and you really need to have them in line with each other. You would have to glue them together very careful or the details wouldn't match. Or you can actually use what it's called keys to help you with these kinds of problems. Keys are small objects that will help you to attach objects to each other. And these can have lots of different shapes. Uh, square shapes, uh, cylinders, uh, you can even use half of a sphere as a key 
or anything else really. As long as it works, you're good to go. But I usually go for squared shape keys because that works just fine for statues. And I basically just need to drop a cube on this surface. I can either insert a new cube on the subtool list or even better, I can use an IMM brush and draw a cube directly on this surface. And that's what I'm going to do. So I like to use Shane Olson's IMM brush and uh, select this cube right here and drop it on the surface. I also want to move it a little bit deeper, mask everything except this face and scale it so this can end up with a tapered shape. If I don't taper this, the key won't work very well, so you won't be able to attach both pieces. And if I scale this up, I won't be able to also attach this object to the base. So don't forget to taper the keys. Only thing I have left to do with this object is to just dynamesh this again. Okay, so this looks pretty good. I actually just uh, want to polish this entirely by going here to deformation and just type 1 on the polish slider. Or I can just smooth this area with a smooth brush, but using the polish in the deformation menu will work just fine. I'm done with this object, but I'm still not able to attach it to the base. I still have to subtract the key I created, so let's do that and turn on live boolean. Make sure that the subtractor is underneath the base. Change the boolean process to subtract and here we go. This is what I want, so let's create this object by clicking on make boolean mesh and insert the new tool back to this subtool list. Also delete the original and here you go. These two objects are ready, but before taking this to print, uh, I just want to lower the polycon. So it's uh, just a little bit high for what I need. I don't really need this to be so high. So let's go here to Z plugin, Decimation Master, and click here where it says Pre process all. This will take some time depending on how many subtools you have and ZBrush is analyzing every object on the scene and when it's ready I can go down here and drop this number to 5%. So what this means is that when I actually decimate these two objects they will end up with just 5% of polygons they had originally. So this number is relative to every object and you might need to pump this number a bit higher depending on the detail, but 5% will work just fine. So let's decimate all the objects. I end up with a really low poly count, and when I export these files, this will be pretty light, which is great. So let's talk about exporting these objects as STL files. I can go here to 3D Print Hub, and export the files and here you will find some different options and I want to take a look at these size sliders and options because I want to import this object to Cura and I want it to have a certain size. So let's say I want this print to be 100 millimeters. The first thing to be aware is that when you export objects to print it will first create a bounding box around the subtool you have selected. And these numbers right here are the dimensions of that bounding box. Let's go down here to geometry and open up this size menu. And what you see here is the size of the actual object in ZBrush. If I drag any of these sliders, it will change in real time the size of the object in the scene. And if I go back to 3D Print Hub, and click here on Update Size Ratios, you will get a few options to choose from. One thing to notice are these numbers, which are exactly the same you see on this size menu. And I want to choose this one using uh, millimeters as unit. 
So this will update all the sizes on 3D Print Hub. And if I export this as it is, this object will be this size in millimeters. I can also change it to inches, but I rather work in millimeters. If I hit this export to STL button, it will not only export the subtool you have selected using these exact sizes, but also the other subtool proportionally. For now, this might be way too small. Remember, I want this entire print to be 100 millimeters high, but even if I change this to 100 millimeters, it means that the subtool I have selected will be 100 millimeters high. So that also means that the, the other subtool will be proportional to this one. So the end result will be a much taller print. The solution here is to create a new subtool that will work as a bounding box for both objects. So I just need to insert any kind of object, but I like to use a cylinder. Just need to scale it until it covers the entire area of the print. And now that I have a new subtool that works as a bounding box, I go back to 3D Print Hub, update the size ratios, and take this Y to uh, 100 millimeters. And since this object will be exported with this size, that means that all the other two will be proportional and they will match the final size I want. So let's export this and save it to the desktop. And now I have a few options here. I usually choose this one that uses the subtool name as the file name. So this is pretty useful if you give names to your subtools. After this, I can open the files in Cura and they are ready to print. So, yep, this is it for the basics of how to prepare objects for printing. On the next lesson, let's take a look at a good model for printing versus a bad model for printing.